Hello everyone, welcome to Archie Marathon. This um, Am I interrupting? Yes, you are. This week we're gonna talk about Turn the studio culture! Whoa. This week we're trying to we're trying to talk about studio culture. Studio culture. Roll the intro. That's much quieter. This is for the, uh, the old people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the geriatric scooter. He's younger than me, but he's a broken old man. So Kev posed the question, do we still need studio culture? The answer is yes, obviously, you really need studio culture. It is a must for any healthy design environment, you know, studio, place, office. To learn, to share information, it's necessary. The end. So we are old enough to have been educated within a studio environment. So each year group, when I first turned up at the first year of university, we had the first year studio and everybody had a desk and it was open and it was an amazing space where lecturers and tutors came in and out of that space, but it was essentially your space. We now have a generation of people who know none of it. Hmm. They're used to turning up to lectures and then going home and doing their drawing, thinking, designing in isolation from other people, which to me is mind blowing because as we've talked about before, it's not one sort of hero architect designing things, it takes a village <laughs> to design something. So we've talked a lot before about the fog of war, um, about this idea that you're so stuck in trying to solve the problem that you can no longer see the problem. <laughs> you don't have this objectivity. Um, and what is very true, and I bet you a lot of you can uh, relate to this, is it seems easier to teach design and architecture than to do design and architecture. Mm. And if you've got, gotten a mate who you've seen struggling with a particular thing, and you've probably found it really easy to go over and say, oh, have you thought of this and thought of that? And you suddenly come away from that going, I'm a genius. Like I absolutely, how did he not see that? I absolutely sorted, sorted that out. Which is the best way to learn, teaching. Well, that's the thing. And then you go back to your drawing board and you're like, oh God, I wish somebody would do that for me. But a lot of these things in studios are not planned, right? They, they are just completely spontaneous, serendipitous moments and fun moments. You know, you ask anyone who, who spent time in studio and, and after they left university, they, they always recall the good times in the studios. There's like some of the best memories are the times in the studio. Yeah, you think about what students seem to be, well, at least the universities we refer to in, in Melbourne, they, they appear to be left with just the bits that aren't quite as fun, which is attending lectures and then going home and drafting. Um, and those two things are fine, but it's what happens in, you know, in between those things. You know, it's not the destination, it's the journey, it's that kind of thing. What happens, that in the, you know, serendipity is the word, within a studio environment. So we're currently sitting in what was until a couple of days ago, the Austin Maynard Architects studio, and we all shared this space. Um, we've now got this beautiful new space um, in the city, um, but this sort of gave us time to stop and think about the, how, how wonderful it is for an organisation, whether it's students or whether it's uh, in a business, in a design studio, an architect studio, to actually share space. And what we find works a lot is because we're all in the same space, we're all sharing knowledge across projects. So everybody will be working on a different project at the same time. A couple of people might be working on the same project, but somebody will just say, oh, how do I, I don't know how to deal with this gutter here. And another person will just see it or overhear it. And you'll just suddenly find these little bubbles of activity and discussion. People not related to that project at all come across and have great input into it. If you're within a studio, like at the University of Tasmania, where we're all the one year group and typically doing all the same project, I wonder if that's as effective as a mixed studio environment where you might have first years, fifth years and everything in between and people doing a variety of projects. Everyone's kind of holding back in their, their own little thing as opposed to you're completely open to someone else's that you have no idea, different year levels, different projects and then you are open to a conversation about it. I, I can tell, we, we at Sydney University back in the day, we had a student common room and the best times 
apart from being in the studio, well, we didn't really have studio, we had the common room. So that was kind of like an in, impromptu sort of studio as well. Mm. Um, the best quits I've ever had during university was from uh, a more senior student. That's a really good point because, yeah, you do find with lecturers and tutors and then also visiting um, crits, they've got no skin in the game, as it were. You know, they can say whatever they want. And they just get off scot-free. Where if you do get a crit from somebody else, especially a senior student, um, I, I can remember the same thing. And they would just give you tips and tricks. Yes. So something that would take me, like, you know, four hours to do, they'd be like, hey, look at this, and it took five minutes. Tips and tricks, that's a huge one. And, yeah. and this, is, this is something you cannot get in a, a class studio environment, studio environment. Yeah. Because you're just, you're just getting feedback, as opposed to just actually physically working in a studio and, and learning these things as you go. Because yeah. these are, these are practice-based things. But it's like, you know, it's like a cauldron of just ideas then, people working on different things. And the same happens uh, in our office too. So somebody, you, it happens all the time. You just see on the corner of your eye somebody doing something on a screen, like copy, paste, copy, paste, and you'll just go over and just say, hey, watch this, boom, and just, you know, you'll give them a new command, which will, and then they'll suddenly be like, oh my God, that's gonna save me so much more time. Yeah. It's those little things, it's not just design decisions, it's just efficiencies as well. Efficiencies. And if you're stuck at home and all you've got is YouTube. It's all about time. If all you've got is YouTube to sort of look up the latest sort of tricks and tips. IQ Marathon. <laughs> then it's not gonna be as effective as sharing a space with other people that are going through similar things. I think we need to stay hydrated. He knows how to keep me engaged. That's how it works in the studios, right? You've got to stay hydrated. Yeah. Don't throw it at the camera. Ooh. Oh, oh. <laughs> that's so close. I don't care, it's not mine, it's his. It is an action camera. Oh, is it? <laughs> I'll show you action. I'm going to strap that to my board. I'm going to ollie over it. I haven't ollied for like 12 years, so I'll probably land on it. What's an ollie, the nerd says. I do wonder how much has changed though. So again, when I was at university, we were at the transition to computers. We were still using drawing boards. Mm -hmm. So quite often you'd walk around and you'd be this giant drawing on somebody's drawing board and some stuff pinned up next to them. Um, and that meant you could come over and be like, huh, what are you doing there, loser? And then you could grab like yellow trace and just quickly, hey, have you ever thought of this? And you could just do that. Where when it's sort of withheld and trapped on a screen, I wonder mm. if it's different now, if studio culture's like, look at my PDF. It's like, well, that's great, but and whether you've got to, you end up being more abstract. Yeah, what you, command should I use in Rhino? Yeah, instead of just putting a black line on a white bit of paper, or yellow. Hmm. Has it changed? I am wondering, I think there's, there's definitely a whole generation now starting, or started, um, who have been affected by COVID. So mm. some people have never, ever set foot in the studio, yeah. let alone a classroom studio, to a physical studio space and then also of course the question of work you know a lot of us were forced to work at home um, and through zoom and other things is there a need for physical office space yes and why so i'm not usually bloody minded about things but if i can have my team in one space i want my team in one space because you get not for not just for me they also say it as well, you get not only a bit of a unit happening in terms of this is what we do, so you have this shared common knowledge of this is what's important in our organisation, but also they do love the fact that, you know, they're extraordinary people, the people that I employ, and they get to access each other's expertise because they're all quite different. Um, so it's fundamental to the way we work. And we've had, um, we've done well during COVID working remotely, and I think it is because these are exceptional people. I'm not just saying that, like we employ great people at Austin Main Architects. Um, so they've been able to keep it going, but whenever we can get back into this studio, it's been great. People are just like, oh, bring me back, bring me back. So you can have those conversations again. 
But is that part of the culture of, of having an astute studio culture, as opposed to people who have never really worked together with anyone, has always just worked at home, and then getting out to the workplace where it is a group environment. You well, know, there's group work episode, but it's definitely in a studio environment where everyone's working together on different projects often, mm. but there is this synergy and things that happens in that space that is unspoken. Well, I do wonder, just as you said that, I'm wondering whether there might be some of that in some, in some of the younger people that have come across, that have worked for us in the last few years. We've said this at senior levels at Ostermain Architects, that there isn't a questioning that we expect. So people will get lost in something and then just hide away for like a week. And we'll come back a week later and say, how are you going with that thing? And they'll go, oh, I don't really Gee, know. that sounds exactly <laughs> like what students do at studio. Well, and you so- just disappear for a week and then come back and go, oh, show me your work. Exactly, so this is a real, this was a huge point of frustration for Mark Austin and I. Like, oh, why didn't you just put up your hand and say something or go to the person next to you and just say something? And I, you know, this is sort of dawning on, now, on me now. This may be sort of a product of the way that we were taught versus the way that the, uh, this, this current generation is taught, where they're at home and where their problems just get compounded. And they might send a message to somebody, but the other person is kind of like, I don't really get it. Where we're quite used to being in a studio and saying, hey, how do I do this? And it's solved. Like in 30 seconds it's solved, instead of sitting on it for a week going, oh my God, I'm gonna get fired. And going, hiding, yeah. yeah. Like ask a question, like you're more likely to get fired <laughs> if you hide away and don't ask a question, then ask a question. We want questions because you're young and you don't know as much as us, so please ask the person next to you. That shows you're actually really efficient and really good. But I do think that's a skill that's learnt if you've been educated within a studio. And I reckon that's where our viewers need to ask themselves. If you only know design studio from working at home, where you aren't around other people, what happens to your problem solving? Like seriously, like if so, if you come against a problem, what do you actually do about it? I, I'd love to see comments about this because I imagine it's actually quite isolating in a way. It must be really stressful. We're back in a studio culture days. We would just say to the person, you don't have an answer, okay, I'll ask them, I'll ask them. Here's another thing, kind of relates to another episode that we we're gonna talk about. But I think I, I find on Discord, for example, because um, we do see people ask questions, but they ask questions in complete isolation of anything, it's just completely out of context. You say, here's my problem, here's just this. And everyone just go, uh, we can answer it, but like, we need to see the big picture. Mm. But it, being in a studio environment, you are kind of aware of what others are doing. So you can put that immediately in context if they ask you something, you understand, okay, but you're trying to do this, right? So I know what you're asking, but you need to look at the big, bigger picture. Whereas I think online and things when people don't understand the big picture, they ask these little things yeah. and they just get answered as, as this little thing without understanding the big picture. That might be just the age we live in. Like everything, the, our entire world is being broken down into just little tiny moments. Assessment and tasks. maybe that's what it is. Tick, tick, tick. But even, you know, look at the, look at the attention economy. Everything is about little moments. Um, and you know, this is probably mourning studio culture. Remember how somebody would be struggling with something on their drawing board and then they'd just sort of grab a wad of other sketches they had and sort of plonk it there and sort of go, oh, I was thinking that, I was thinking that, I was thinking that, and then you'd be like, that, yeah. that's interesting. And you could pull that out and play with it. And like, this is the thing about a physical world. You can actually get it, draw over it, and mm. get a bunch of people around a drawing table. Mm, mm. That becomes very, very hard when you're looking at a screen. Or, and I don't mean to sound like a Luddite, but I, I think this is probably what's being lost and we need to find new ways of overcoming this. Mm. If the technology is dividing our ability to problem solve in a really organic, physical way, then at the very least, we need to get that technology in one room with the people involved. So you can be pointing at things and compare screens and mm. stuff like that. But if you're stuck at home, I feel really sorry for you. So what's the moral of the story? No, don't drink yourself into a stupor. <laughs> um, get, get yourself a shared studio. Like, honestly, that is just really good advice that I think you should all take on board. If you are working on your own in a room, go and find another room with another person in it working on similar problems. Well, there, there used to be tradition. Like, I, I went to Melbourne University and they had desks. There was, you know, lock-up studio. We had our own lock-up studio. We completely decked out the place with old couches and bookshelves they were throwing away. We, we, had shared, we shared our library books, we borrowed books and we just shared it commonly. Like, and then you go, oh, what's this book? And go pick up and, and read. 
Um, but also, yeah, we, we had just, just 24 hour access, which was great. Um, but uh, yeah, just, just uh, com compared to you know, other universities which didn't have a physical space like RMIT, or even AA in London, I know that people, because they were just three terrace houses. Yeah. So people rent out spaces in the city and found like cheap leases and they would have almost like a shared house, but a shared studio. And, of, and it'd be like residencies that, you know, someone would move on because they've graduated and then someone else would come in to get interviewed and, yeah. and become this part of this studio family. Yeah. Yeah, well, Elliot Dutton, one of my amazing staff members, he was at Melbourne Uni uh, for a long time. And as it transitioned away from studio space, they went and just hired, just rented a house. So that he lived somewhere else, but then him and just a bunch of students said, this is ridiculous. And they hired a house and that house only served as a studio space and they had a shared internet connection. And so they would live elsewhere and then just turn up and sort of work together on different projects. Uh, I do think it's a shame that you don't then have like the tutor or the lecturer's office right next door mm. where they can pop in and pop out and engage. But it does show the need um, for that engagement with other people going through other things and other problem solvers around you. That's quite interesting too, the renting the space, separating it from home. It is this, I know, yes, we have been working at home, working from home as, as lockdown has been the case for most people in the world. But this separation of work and domestic life, I think that's quite important. And certainly someone for me, I cannot work at home. I had home office, you know, uh, I can't work at home. Well, COVID's now provided the data that says you need a separate space. Yeah. Um, the, the data is very real and it's for people working, but also for students, showing that students that don't have a dedicated workspace at home um, suffer not only educationally, but their mental health suffers mm. as well. Um, most of our, our briefs for single residential now um, have separate workspaces. So we've got to find a way of accommodating spaces that can become a, a workspace mm. for a while. But getting them away from um, your sort of domestic spaces has become fundamentally important, not because of the risk to your work, but because of the risk to your free time, mm. to your home mm. time, to your family time, or however you spend your time away from work. Um, so we do know you need to separate those things, but I guess what we're advocating here, what I'm very much advocating here for, is not only separate your studio space, but share that studio space with somebody else has to happen, it has to happen for your own mental health and for the betterment of your projects and for the evolution of your design thinking and your problem solving. You need to borrow off other people because design is a team sport. Star architects walk into a room after the studio has gotten together and proposed a whole heap of things. God, you know, he needs, he or she wants six different proposals and them as a team have rallied to, to create all this and then the star architect comes along and goes, that one. And, and so it's an illusion. There is no individual genius. It's, it's a team sport. So get used to sharing a space with other people that are design athletes like you. Right, choose your weapon. The big one. You could go Kimbo. And, yeah. and that one. Whoa, 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 hang on. This is only up two plus three. You've got a lot more there. Yeah, yeah, but I'll just take the Yeah, all. this is a single oh, But how does it work? Is I this a no cock? Is it... oh, oh, that's how it works. I think I fixed it. Oh, I'm... Oh. <laughs> I'm just trying to knock your camera off. Any self-respecting studio should have... <laughs> Say bye bye to this space. Oh. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Almost went over your phone there. Yeah, don't break the place before you leave a place. Yeah, we've still got to get the bond back. Like, comment, subscribe. Bye. See ya.